You are listening to History Man, a platform for historians, curators, and authors to tell their stories of the American Revolution, walk in the footsteps of heroes, and proclaim freedom reigns. On today's episode, we're with Michael Burgess talking about the Battle of Blackstocks. So welcome, Michael. Well, thank you. Michael, the Battle of Blackstocks is a, uh, an interesting battle in that uh, Tarleton is defeated for the first time in South Carolina. Is that correct? Well, it depends on how you look at this. Okay. Right. Uh, and depends on, on which report you follow and which writing you follow and what the definition is uh, of win and loss. But, but it certainly is the first uh, of a few difficult days in, in the Carolinas for, for Bannister Charlton. Well, very good. Was, fill our ears, please, with, uh, with your knowledge, old wise one. Well, I, I don't know about the old wise one, but I, I've certainly, uh, according to my wife, spent an inordinate amount of time studying a battle that is an hour and a half away, and she believes it's because I was tr- trying to get out of yard work, which is partially true. Uh, but the Battle of Blackstock's Plantation takes place on November 20, 20th, 1780. And because it is wedged in the narrative between Kings Mountain and Cowpens, it often gets overlooked for the significant battle that it is, uh, that that arguably without Blackstocks you might not have cowpins, uh, and without cowpins, yeah, you know, then all of a sudden the the course of the revolution does shift. Uh, but I started on on this battle, goodness gracious, 2004, 2005, and and someone you've had on this show before, Charles Baxley from Southern Campaigns of the American Revolution saw that I was, was interested in this story and proceeded to say, well, why don't, you, why don't you be the research guy on it? I said, great. Figured a month, six months, maybe a year, and I'd be done. And here we are 17 years later, and I'm still working on this battle, and I'm still intrigued by every element of it. And really, there, there's three reasons why I think this is a fascinating battle. Number one, it's, it's, it's militia, it's patriot militia versus British regulars where the British regulars do not hold the field at the end of the day. Second, it's another account, a, a teachable moment where you have real people making real decisions with real consequences. And the beauty of that, and you say, well, that's every battle. The Blackstock's battlefield is so perfectly preserved, you can go through these, you know, the, the day of these real people and the real decisions and the real consequences without the interruption or interference of the modern world. And then finally, who doesn't like a good duel? Uh, obviously, there is a play on Broadway, which involves a duel between Hamilton and Burr. Uh, we love it when Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader have their lightsaber duels. But this duel, I think, is better than both of those in that you have this, the second and final engagement between Bannister Tarleton and Thomas Sumter, two of the most effective, controversial, uh, charismatic, uh, just, you know, the figures that if you ask someone about Tarleton or Sumter, there's, there's no middle ground. It, it's a love-hate relationship, and you can even be a patriot and, and hate, hate Sumter, and you can be a member of the British Army and hate Tarleton. And so it, it's this very real individual confrontation between the two. And arguably, they they both really behaved out of character on, on this at late after November afternoon in 1780. So the, their first um, engagement that was, was kind of known was at Fishing Creek. Fishing right. Creek, correct. This is after the battle. This is Battle of Camden. Sumter goes to the west and takes over, Cary, takes down Cary's Fort, is making his way back north with a whole entourage of supplies and prisoners and cattle, and uh, and then runs into a column of British that were coming to help out at Camden, and he takes them prisoner, and they're on this long march, and finally, after the Battle of Camden is lost... Tarleton is sent uh, after Sumter, and uh, and then they meet at Fishing Creek, and they're both just exhausted. 
from their long march and their, their days of fighting and, and that sort of thing. And that was the, the first engagement with Sumter in Charlton. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Uh, a couple things about that engagement. Number one, yes, they, they are both absolutely exhausted, but they, they deal with that in different ways. Tarleton deals with exhaustion by continuing to push on. Right. Uh, and he is masterful at stalking an opponent and, and surprising them. He does it throughout the war. He's, he's masterful at understanding how to conceal things, uh, such as uh, on August 17th, the, the Battle of the Fishing Creek is the 18th. Uh, that night, he camps along the, the Broad River where, uh, or Catawba, depending on, you know, the name changes three different times when you go up up, up the river. It's actually, and, I, and I'm wrong, it's, it's the Watery or the Catawba River, whichever you want to call it. Uh, and does so with no campfires. Across the river, he, he sees campfires, uh, and, and he scouts, uh, and he realizes Sumter has no idea that he is in the neighborhood. In fact, that morning, there's this poignant scene of Tarleton cresting this hill and looking down in this valley in between uh, the Catawba River and Fishing Creek, at this Patriot camp with no security, uh, men in different stages of, of undress, and it finds Sumter dealing with his fatigue, sleeping under a wagon, uh, minus clothes, minus anything else. And it's the single, it, it is every cavalry officer's dream to have something like this, and, and, and Tarleton takes full advantage of it, thunders down the hill, Right, you know, rides back and forth through the encampment, r routes whatever resistance there is. Sumter barely gets away on the back of a horse, minus his army with him, minus any weapons, minus his clothes. And if you believe the anecdotal account that is told in a book that Charles, the historian Charles Braceland Flood writes in, in the 1970s, he knocks himself out on a tree on, on this escape. Now, whether that's true or not, so when we say face-to-face -face engagement, it's hard to call Fishing Creek face-to-face. -face. Uh, it is a, an absolute catastrophe for Thomas Sumter. However, as Sumter does throughout the war, you can beat him, but he's always going to be able to recruit and come back. And that's what Sumter is doing in November of 1780. He has rebuilt his force. He is active in what is today Fairfield, Fairfield County, north of Winsboro, where Cornwallis's army is located. Tarleton, meanwhile, is in Sumter and Clarendon County, today Sumter and Clarendon County. Think Poinsett State Park down to the lake, that area chasing Marion. When Cornwallis attempts to deal with Sumter with someone else other than Tarleton, and it ends up being a disaster for the British at Fishdam Ford, where you have Major James Weems, who to me is a far worse war criminal than, than Tarleton for his burning of plantations and churches and whatnot, attempt a night assault on Sumter's camp. And unlike Fishing Creek, while Sumter was still asleep and in his tent at Fishdam, his colonels were ready for him and baits a trap by which the mounted 63rd rides into the Patriot encampment in dark, is silhouetted by the campfires, and Sumter's militia, you know, butchers them uh, and, and destroys this unit. The 63rd retreats. Their men are left on the field. Uh, Sumter is actually, and I think this is one of the, the dark things we, don't, we often miss with the American Revolution, is the target of assassination force. A small group of three, four, five men that, that head to Sumter's tent, and they go in one side, and Tump, Sumter goes out the other and ends up hiding down on the riverbank in, in the frosty cold of, this, of the November night, shivering uh, as, as the battle finishes up. And that really is, is where the, black, the road the Black Stocks begins. Uh, the next day, Sumter's men cross over, this time I got my river correct, the Broad River into Union County, they are you know, spiriting up the Patriot people. They are adding to 
their force. They add Jordans to, uh, the Georgians to this. Uh, they are also sending detachments out to quell the loyalists. Cornwallis writes uh, that you know that Sumter is, is is basically scaring all of our friends who are now fleeing down to the Congarees, which is Granby, which is present day Casey. Uh, Sumter is also watching has a group blackguarding uh, a, a, the encampment of the 71st and the, the remnants where the remnants of the 63rd mounted will gather at Briarley's Ferry, which is a, in Fairfield across from Hart's Ferry Road in Newberry. They're attacking Loyalist Mills. They, they even, he sends an attachment as far as where the I-20 bridge crosses Broad River around Columbia to, to intimidate a group of Loyalists. It very much is a slow victory procession for Sumter because with all these these detachments in and out, he can't move at a rapid pace, but he begins to move towards 96. Now, How many men does Sumter have at this time? If he's got that many detachments, how many men does he have? It, it, the, if you count all the detachments, which of course will return to camp, uh, on the afternoon of November 20th, uh, it's upwards of 1,000. A thousand to twelve hundred. We talked about this before. Uh, Sumter's uh, magnetism that he's able to keep this many men in the field, as opposed to one of the other heroes, right, of, right. Of the revolution, Francis Marion, who can't, who, who can't depend on them on right. any given day or di- any given uh, raid that he's right. involved in. Uh, of course, a lot of that had to do with Francis Marion is operating behind the enemy line. True. And as opposed to I, Sumter, who's on the borderline. I also think, and if you follow sports, there's always this phrase, a player's coach. I think Sumter is very much uh, a, a militia man's leader. I mean, he understands how to praise them, reward them. Uh, obviously, there's the controversial reward of Sumter's law. Um where Marion is a, a strict, stern, disciplinary, and continental officer. And I think there's something to that, right. in addition to operating right. behind, behind the lines right. uh, with that. So Sumter is, is, is really active at, at this. From November 9th, 1780, to, to the morning of November 20th, it's just constant, uh, spirit, you know, basically spiriting up the people, slowly moving the main column, towards the 96 area. No one is real sure at this point whether his intent was to try to take 96, which would have been impossible with just a militia army. I mean, it was impossible for Nathaniel Green and the Continental Army with artillery. Or is he targeting at a loyalist outpost uh, known as Williams Fort, you know, built by a patriot James Williams, who of course dies at Kings Mountain and is now loyalist occupied. Uh, he's also, it is told, an anecdotal story that has James Weems in the wagon, and he's showing him off his, his prize of battle right? okay. uh, until he is exchanged. Uh, so it is, it is really a problem for Cornwallis, where he is seeing loyalist control over this area uh, being undone by Sumter. And so who does he call for? He calls for his hammer. He calls for Charlton. Anytime there's a problem... He's going to call for Tarleton. And so Tarleton receives notice of this as, you know, November 9th, that this has happened. He finishes his business uh, in Clarendon Sumter, meaning that he issues a proclamation saying, I'll be back and I'll be glad to burn everything down if you guys don't behave uh, to go to Camden. He bypasses Winsboro for Cornwallis fears that if, if the British Legion show up in Winsboro, they're going to eat too much of the forage. Uh, and ends up at, at Briarley's Ferry, which is, if, if people are looking at a map of South Carolina, I, is, is just east of Pomeria today, north of Parshall's Dam, and directly west of, of Lake Monticello in that area on, on the Broad River. He arrives on the 18th in the afternoon, late morning afternoon, uh, and he, there is this Patriot unit across the river, where Tarleton makes sure his men stay concealed so they don't see the green coats. And the members, the, the officer, uh, uh, McAllister of the 71st, and the new officer of the 63rd, since Weems had been severely wounded and captured, 
and his subordinate officer led them into this disaster. Cornwallis detaches his aide-de-camp, John Money, to, to take control of the 63rd. They reportedly use a three-pounder to drive Sumter's men off from the opposite bank of the river, where earlier that day, Sumter's men had sniped a member of the 63rd in the canoe that was simply trying to have a bath and blew him out the canoe. Uh, Tarleton sends the 71st and the 63rd across the river at Briarley's Ferry, in which still Sumter's men can see this. But then he takes the British Legion downriver to roughly Parshall's Dam and crosses there. They camp the night of the 18th. On the 19th, Tarleton spends the day trying to figure out what is Sumter's main column because of, of, of intelligent reports of patriots everywhere at this point. Eventually, the night of the 19th, by I think a sheer fate of luck, Tarleton camps along Indian Creek, roughly four to five miles away from Sumter's main encampment. But Tarleton doesn't realize that. It's been a frustrating day. Where the night of the 19th, uh, a, 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 and then he, is, he finally learns the night of the 19th that Sumter's camp is up ahead, and the British Legion, uh, the 71st, the 63rd, go to bed with the, in the intent of waking up 3, 4 in the morning and surprising, Fishing Creek style, Thomas Sumter once again. Sumter has no knowledge of, of Tarleton being in the area, much less a few miles away. And then fate intervenes. A member of the 63rd deserts, finds Sumter's camp. I can almost hear that conversation. General Sumter, do you know who's on the, a few miles away from you? And immediately Sumter awakens his men, saddle up, and they begin to move away from Tarleton along the Ennery River. The problem for Sumter is, why not just quickly disperse? He has detachments still out that he has to bring in. And so in the morning of the 20th, a rallying point is decided, is recommended by Patriot Colonel Th Thomas Brandon, that Blackstock's farm, where there is a developed colonial road and a ford across the broad uh, across the Tiger River, people know where it is. It's on a major road. This is where he's going to bring all his men together. You know, in, uh, when we look at the history of World War II and even even today, uh, we have this vision of generals getting together over the table with a map and and that sort of thing. Do they have maps of? of how are they deciding this? Because if you got detachments from the new acquisition district all the way over I, to New Six, I'm not sure that they would know all these little hills and valleys. A, a and lot, a lot of it would be possibly hand drawn maps. Right. But in terms of hey, let me go pull a map out of the file, it doesn't exist. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, there's some maps of individual battles. There's some, you know, in in the Cornwallis papers, some rough drawn maps from his officers. But generally, you're depending on. The, the the locals. Right. Cartography well, had not taken off as a profession. Well, well it had, had but but the for the, for the British, the backs, backs. you know, they're just they don't. Have, for example, it would be like us landing at D Day and not having any maps of Europe, right. <laughs> and, and so you have to depend on the locals to get you okay. where you need to go. All right. So they're they're moving from the Innery and they go to Blackstocks. Correct. And Blackstocks is known as a. A, a pretty big field for cattle. Or, it, it, or it's a it, it's referred to as a plantation. It's a large farm, uh, tobacco, corn, but the most important thing is it's at a major river crossing, I got you. and there is a, a a a official colonial road, an improved road that runs through there. If you go there today, it's actually a very nice historic battlefield site. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost in its natural state out it, there. You know, I and I'm friends with uh, Ranger Don Weaver at Musgroves that superintends uh, Blackstocks, and I joke, I said, the only thing you're missing now is you've got to cut the rest of the pine trees off the hill that the house is on, and then cut all the trees that take up the 40, 50 acre field. Right. That existed at that day, but the rest of it, you know, the topography is 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 the way it was. I mean, it's a it's a sloping hill that, that goes down. Right, and, and you can when you walk out of the field and you you figure out where everybody was aligned at, you can actually see the battle take place in front of. Right, you. So, I mean, it, it's one of the 
best places in the state to to get into tactics right because you, you're literally walking the ground as it was was there uh, any stories about Walnut Grove was there a woman who came from Walnut Grove to, to so I, I think the story is Mary Dillard okay and if you look at like a topo map or any map that lists cemeteries that south of the NRE today there is a Dillard cemetery okay. and Mary Dillard is is there in that area watching as Tarleton approaches okay. so so the way to chase you know of course Tarleton arrives that morning Sumter's gone he begins tracking him Sumter can't just disappear because he's trying to bring his detachments in they settle on the rattling point uh, at Black Stocks, and he'll arrive there early afternoon, but he has to wait. He can't just abandon his army. Tarleton is trying to be a good combined arms force commander because he does have the British Legion cavalry with him. He does have a mounted, the mounted 63rd with him. But he also, and he has a company of the 71st mounted. But then he has three, two to three hundred uh, infantrymen and an artillery piece. So he's trying to keep his force together. Roughly at the Dillard t- land, uh, Tarleton makes the decision, because they, the day is beginning to disappear, to leave his foot soldiers, even though he would have doubled up as many of them as he could on horseback, just like he did going to Waxhaws. But leave the rest of them, leave the artillery, come up as soon as you can, and I'm going to pursue him with a mounted force, something I'm going to pursue. Mary Dillard sees this, takes a shortcut, tells Sumter that Tarleton is close to crossing the Ennery, but he doesn't have his artillery, and he doesn't have his full complement of infantry with him. Some, uh, Tarleton will cross the Ennery at, at what is today present-day Jones Ford, and he sees what he believes is an amazing gift. And it appears there is Patriot Militia at the Ford. And so he immediately gives the order to charge. They ride down on this group. They begin to slash and hack and, and stab and everything else until they realize these were Loyalist prisoners that Sumter, under Patty Carr, had put under Patty Carr's uh, a control. That Patty Carr had left. This is Patty Carr, the Irishman. Yes, the Irishman. And yeah, he, had been, he had been taking care of these prisoners Saul Tarleton got his cue. He takes off. The Loyalists, of course, aren't going to run because it's Tarleton. But when you order a, a cap- cavalry charge and they come thundering down the hill, it's not like you can get them to stop or communicate with them. And so Tarleton ends up cutting up Loyalist prisoners. Uh, he will not admit to that in his immediate letter after the battle to Cornwallis. He simply refers to it as the Patriot Rear Guard. And he will hold on to that forever, even though we know it's Loyalist prisoners. Tarleton continues, crosses the NRE, heading to Blackstocks. And at 4 o'clock, at the, the entrance to, at, at opposite of Blackstocks Farm, at an entrance to a rail lane, chaos ensues. Uh, one of Sumter's detachments under Thomas Taylor comes in with wagons full of flour, Thunders down, there's a creek that the the Colonial Road crosses to go up to Blackstock's farm. He thunders down the road with his wagons. Anecdotal story goes that it busts the the, the barrel heads and their white flower on this, what is a corduroy road over this creek as you go up to the Blackstock's farm. At the same time, Tarleton's lead lead elements arrive and collide with, with Sumter's pickets. And so there's just this mass at the opposite the Blackstock's farm uh, inside of Sumter uh, and his men who had been in the field trying to get a meal, starting to cook some meat, cook some dough, whatever. And Tarleton, of course, or Sumter immediately calls for a council of war. Uh, obviously, they're not going to retreat, but more or less to decide, you know, who's going to be where, etc. They're scrambling. Tarleton's lead element awaits the rest of Tarleton's force. Uh, and about that time, Mary Blackstock. Now, we don't know where the father Blackstock was during this battle. But we do know 
the woman of the farm is home, and she comes out and tells Sumter she will not have any fighting on this farm. Uh, of course, no history doesn't record his response. Hopefully, he was a gentleman and ushered her back inside to take cover. Uh, but but I'm sure that conversation did not go the way that Mary Blackstocks wanted. Tarleton, in the meantime, has deployed his forces to his right down in a 50-acre field. He puts the mounted 63rd and, and what elements of the 71st have been doubled up. They tie their horses in the back of the field, and they form in linear formation in this field. Tarleton then spreads the British Legion cavalry to his left, trying to overlap what he believes is the Patriot line, but Sumter judiciously has stretched his line in a semicircle from the Tiger River back into some woods where he has placed Edward Lacey, and the woods are the far right, Patriot far right. Tarleton doesn't see them. So his line does not overlap in, in British tactical doctrine, the Patriot line. And then there's a pause. Remember, both Tarleton and Sumter are known for frontal attacks in any circumstance. Yet, I think that's the power and the influence of the ground at Blackstock's, where I'd encourage people to visit. Tarleton realizes that a frontal assault up steep hillsides or a cavalry charge in a fence-lined lane where the fences are log rails, they're not little split rails, full log rails, would, would, would be catastrophic. Sumter understands that he, he has a great defensive position. He wants to be attacked. But when Tarleton pauses, Sumter decides to send a small attachment down the hill, across the creek, into the 50-acre field to fire away at the infantry under Lieutenant John Money, commanding the 63rd and the, the, the small group of the 71st with them. Money takes the bait, begins to advance, and once Money coming across this 50-acre field to the left front of the Blackstock's house, if I'm sitting in the Blackstock's house, I can see the British coming. Tarleton and Money realize they have made a huge, that, that Money has made a huge mistake. Because in all the buildings on Blackstock's Hill, there are sharpshooters. Uh, in the house, in the barns, behind these, these huge thick fence rails, it is a beehive of, uh, of rifles and muskets begging to be attacked. When Money's men begin to press the Patriots in the field, these are Georgians under, under Colonel John Twiggs, um, the Georgians begin to give ground because they don't have bayonets. But what they're doing is sucking money into the killing zone, which shortly he falls into, and now he is facing fire from his front in the field by the Georgians, and then from monies, the British left, the British left, the British infantry left front is getting assailed from the hill. You begin to see officers fall, money himself is wounded, they lose all structure, they are being pinned down and decimated. Meanwhile, over on the Patriot right, Sumter sends word to Edward Lacey, who is concealed by the woods, to get around the British Legion left flank and attack uh, the Legionnaires, which Lacey's men quietly make their way through the woods and empty upwards of 20 to 30 saddles of the British Legion in this attack. And so now, Tarleton has a problem. On his far left flank, you now have a firefight going on between the British Legion cavalry and most likely British Legion mounted infantry or infantry mounted on the back. On your far right, your infantry is trapped by fire. And now he's come to a moment where he has to make a decision to save his force. And what is the decision? It's what he always does. He puts his cavalry in column. Even though the fences are lined, he sends them thundering down the hill, and the road runs through the center of the Patriot line. He is going to try to split the center, go to the river, and swing around the backside of the Georgians in the field. It's a desperate attempt, and the results are catastrophic. After the battle, people will write that as the cavalry flies up this hill, you know, hemmed in by these big log rail fences, 
it is a cauldron of death. And you have men and horses choking the road. His cavalry force is repulsed, but he does accomplish extricating his infantry briefly because the fire lets up from the hill on the infantry and focus on the cavalry. And now the infantry has reorganized, is pressing the Georgians, and the Georgians begin to break and run. At this point, Richard Wynn, who has been held in reserve in what I call on the battlefield the, the hidden knob, receives an order delivered from Sumter by Major James Jackson of Georgia, in which Jackson orders Wynn to attack into the field to support the Georgians. And Jackson uses the quote, the salvation of this country depends on this single fight. Wynn's men rise up, they charge down the hill, they engage the British Legion, the, the British 63rd and 71st in the field. They are able to finish the job that the riflemen on the hill had begun. Now the riflemen on the hill are now firing back down into them since the cavalry attack has been repulsed. And the, the Legion, the, the, the British Legion cavalry is ordered, led by Tarleton, into the field to protect the 63rd and 71st as they retreat back across the field to their horses. This is where Tarleton does, if, you, if you've seen the movie The Patriot, a very un-Tarleton thing according to pop culture, but I think it's very Tarleton in my studies. As his cavalry, and he personally leads the attack, is in this field shielding his retreating infantry, he sees Lieutenant John Money, Tarleton dismounts, grabs him, throws him on his horse, he's under fire while he's doing all this, from Wynn's men and, and the rallied Georgians, jumps back on his horse and takes wounded money to safety. Uh, at this point, the battle, it, darkness is falling. The battle descends into a melee. Small units against small units. It's a running fight back up the road. Uh, Elijah Clark and the Georgians at the outset of the battle had gone down the Tiger River bank. And had been, and at the time where the 63rd and the 71st retreated, Elijah Clark and them are in, have their horses, and you have just this chaotic withdrawal. It's at this time that Sumter leaves Blackstock's Hill and rides down to be a part of this engagement that a small unit of infantrymen, either 63rd or the 71st, turn and fires a volley in his direction. Sumter realizing he's about to be shot prior to, to the trigger being pulled, turns and presents his right side to protect his heart, and he is hit in the side, his spine is chipped, and he begins to bleed. But the toughness of the man comes through because he returns to headquarters, and it's only when an aide hears the dripping of blood on the leaves that that they realize Sumter has been wounded and is losing blood. At that point where it's pitch black dark, the Patriots have disengaged, Tarleton has rallied his men and linked up with his, slower, his late arriving infantry and artillery a mile or so away from Blackstock's. Sumter at this point is no longer able to lead. He is taken across the river into safety, the Tiger River, uh, Colonel John Twiggs decides that the most prudent course of action would be to withdraw. And so they leave Richard Wynn to stoke the campfires to make it seem like they're staying. And the Sumter's force crosses the river and in a true guerrilla fashion began to disperse. How long did that battle last? If I've well, been out there on November 20th at 4 o'clock, it's no more than an hour. Is that right? uh, with the last part being in almost you know pitch black darkness. Wow. What a fantastic story. Uh, the casualties are enormous. Uh, according to Colonel Charles Middleton, who writes the only after-action report for Sumter, he talks about the, the British leaving 92 dead and 100 wounded on the field and three Patriot killed and four wounded, which just shows the... the, the, the incredible defensive position the Patriots occupied and the price of an assault on that position both by horse and by foot from the British. Uh, I've heard it said that the fact that Sumter got wounded here, despite the fact that, that 
he won a, a great battle against Tarleton. But the fact that he got wounded and had to withdraw from the fighting possibly saved uh, South Carolina in the whole scheme of things. So when Nathaniel Green uh, takes control of the Southern Army in December 1780, he realizes, he surely has been told by about everyone, you have to talk with Sumter uh, and write with Sumter. And Sumter at this point is convalescing. Uh, he won't take to the field for a few months. Uh, but it's pretty quickly that Green realizes. Now, Green at times, if you read his letters, comes across as fairly haughty when, when dealing with the militia officers. But Green realizes he has a problem with Sumter. And even when he detaches his flying army under Daniel Morgan, Sumter complains about Morgan giving his men orders. Fortunately, by this point, a well-respected uh, patriot frontiersman who had been out of the war after the fall of Charleston, Andrew Pickens, is back in the field, who commands immediate respect. And Pickens is able to rally uh, not just his own militia, but elements of Sumter's militia, to join Morgan, that with, with Sumter out of action, there's not too much he can do about that. There is the, the, the hypothesis that uh, given how Sumter refused to or support Gates at Camden directly, as he will refuse to join Green at, at both Hobkirk's and 96, uh, that had Sumter been active in the field pursuing his own plans, that you could have had a significant number of Patriot militia that will be at Cowpens, not at not at Cowpens in this alternate reality, which means you don't have the, the numbers to create the defense in depth at Cowpens. You don't have uh, the force really for Morgan to repel a, a Tarleton assault. I've uh, wondered about Sumter, and perhaps you you too, having studied him. Uh, I wonder if he's just uh, thinking to himself, listen, every time we put our men in the hands of the Continentals, we lose. And every time we take control of them ourselves, we win. So why would I put my hands, my people, in the hands of a Continental officer? The, the problem is, you know, right offhand, I can't think of a single time he put his men in the hands of a Continental officer. The, the first opportunity, of course, would have been the Camden campaign. Well, he doesn't do it there. Okay. Uh, the second opportunity would be Cowpens. He doesn't do it there. The next opportunity would be Hopkirk's Hill. He doesn't do it there. The next opportunity would be 96. He doesn't do it there. And it's only after his Dog Days campaign outside of Charleston where finally Marion and Thomas Taylor and, and, and Lee we're not going to work with this guy anymore. And he gets cashiered, essentially. Do you see uh, Sumter's militia, uh, with, with, of course, Calpins being one, but the only other time they work with the Continentals, and that's at Utah Springs. I think it's interesting. At Calpins and Utah Springs, you have a massive positive militia contribution. Sumter's men are there, but he's not there. Uh, and I, I just, uh, the, the man was a Continental officer. He obviously is charismatic. He obviously knows how to, to organize a force. But throughout the war, he wants to pursue his plans, not somebody else's plans. Michael, this has been a great time, a, a great episode, and I appreciate you sitting down with us. I know you're a history teacher here at River Bluff High School, and you have several things, several projects going on. Tell us about one of your projects. So one of the projects I'm currently working on, uh, in a previous episode, we talked about Godfrey Dreer. So I'm going to unveil another one, hoping people listen to all the episodes. Uh, if you didn't hear my first project, go back and listen to an initial episode. But one of the projects is, is actually somewhat tied to it, is putting together the full Rodden campaign to relieve 96 and back, and specifically in this area of the Midlands where there's a number of different stories that forever, and, and, and I, was, I was guilty of this too, you look at and you just read them as separate stories. Everything from uh, Jun the, the, the Juniper Springs out in Gilbert engagement to Emily Geiger's ride 
to you know the skirmish at Dreer's Dreer Station to Eagleston's capture. But there's a real there's a narrative to be told in in from June third, seventeen eighty one through mid July of Rodden's experience running into the militia and whatnot here in Lexington County. So I'm working on putting that story together uh, as an effort to expand our, uh, really, our understanding of, of Amer the American Revolution in Lexington as we head to the 250th anniversary. Rawdon is paramount to that story here in South Carolina. So. Oh, absolutely. And I think if you look at Rawdon's time here in South Carolina, he, he quite frankly, might have been the most efficient British commander. Uh, just the campaign to relieve 96, even though it doesn't culminate in a huge battle, which is why we often ignore it, it is just a masterful campaign of, of his will to to rescue this place and at the same time to try to uh, negate Green's advantage while facing the heat of summer. He is actually suffering from malaria, and his letters regarding this this period of time are fascinating if you want to get in the mind of, of a British commander facing all these difficult obstacles. Outstanding. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Yeah.